Welcome to Trends with Benefits, a podcast by Van Eck with a forward-looking perspective. We explore new ways of thinking about the markets, investing, work, and life. Here's your host, Ed Lopez. Welcome to another episode of Trends with Benefits. Today, I'll be speaking with Hope Jarkowski, Head of Equities for New York Stock Exchange. Prior to this, Hope was the co-head of Government Affairs for ICE, where she led NYSE's Government Relation Matters before the SEC in Capitol Hill. She's been with ICE since 2016, but started her career at FINRA. She's practiced securities law in the private sector and also worked in the public sector as well at the SEC and for the Senate Banking Committee. Hi, Hope. Hey, Ed. Thanks so much for having me. You know, uh, I was in D.C. for four years. How long have you been in D.C. now? Oh, gosh. I am a permanent resident by D.C. standards, which, as you know, is a really transient town. I've been here since 2001. So I was here September 11th. I went to law school here. I started my career here. So I think I can officially call myself a a, a D.C. native. <laughs> let's talk about uh, let's talk a little bit more about you and, and your current role. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started, how you ended up where you are now? Happy to. I guess in some ways I took the typical path. I went to law school. I worked at FINRA, although when I was there, it was NASD, which tells you how long ago that was. And then on the leading edge of the financial crisis, the SEC um, was looking for people to help them as they navigated the path through uh, Dodd-Frank implementation. So I went from a large law firm to work at the SEC and the general counsel's office, and then later as counsel to a commissioner um, handling all trading and markets matters. So really, it was a, an incredible time to be at the commission because you got to see so many unprecedented things happening. Really, you know, you're in the thick of it, seeing it from every angle. It's also, you know, the opposite of a comfortable government job. I transitioned to the banking committee and got to, you know, meet uh, incredible members of the financial services industry, work with really smart policymakers. And then from there, I transitioned to, um, back to the private sector. And as you mentioned in the intro, I've been at ICE for, it'll be five years in April. I've always been in the DC office handling the regulatory and policy portfolio. And just after Thanksgiving this year, I transitioned to the business side and will be taking over the portfolio for uh, equities at the NYC. So that, in a nutshell, means I'm responsible for the five equity exchanges and you know all, all of the, the business operations attendant to it, as well as really the core of my expertise is sort of driving forward the business strategy in the regulatory environment. Every, every strategic decision that we make at the NYC and at ICE on the whole really has such a regulatory and policy component to it and sometimes political. So they were looking for somebody who has a pretty different skill set than the people who have had this job and as the head of equities in the past, most of whom have spent time on trading floors of all shapes and sizes, different asset classes. So we have a really deep bench of expertise across our relationship management team, our research team, our operations team. And they were I think, you know, we're trying to build out the regulatory component of it and, you know, and attendant to that, the business strategy. Fantastic. What, what do you think the biggest challenge is going to be for you uh, in tackling your, in your new role? Look, it's a really competitive environment and, you know, there are over a dozen exchanges and a multiplier of that um, off exchange venues. Those are challenges, but they also, I believe, present a lot of opportunity We've done some amazing technology advancements in the last couple of years at the NYC, bringing all of our equity platform to a a new technology, pillar technology, as it's referred to, which is just a seamless interface across all of our exchanges for our customers. We're rolling that out this year for our options markets. So at a high, you know, somatic level, I think my goal and the biggest opportunity we have is to demonstrate that the exchanges, the lit, transparent trading environment can be one where you have access to best-in-class technology, deep pools of liquidity, and and access to the data that all of that trading infrastructure produces. So I'm very optimistic that we have an excellent story to tell. And so my challenge and opportunity presented is to to tell the story and move the business forward. You think the the current state of public markets are 
you know, you read more and more about the private markets and private equity and how the market share has grown in that space. And that, I think, what was it, in the uh, late 90s, maybe there were 8,000 public stocks at, at towards the max. And now it's down to, what, three or 4,000 uh, by some measures. How would you characterize the state of public markets today and, and the challenges going forward? Um, it's not a great story for the U.S. investor, frankly. Um, you know, going back, it really, and it's a confluence of factors, a combination of factors, if you will. Uh, a large part of it is due to the regulatory environment. In the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of regulation done to expand opportunity for private investment. Regulation D, we now have uh, Rule 504 uh, offerings under the Jobs Act, which was incredibly well-intentioned piece of legislation. A lot of opportunities presented itself to create what was conceptualized as an on-ramp to public for companies, smaller entities, emerging growth companies, as they refer to EGCs, to harness a set of exceptions to the 33 and 34 Act requirements by the SEC and you know, utilize those as a way of stair-stepping their path to public. So all of those regulatory um, constructs, while well-intentioned, have really made it easier to stay private in the long run, which I don't think was certainly not the genesis behind the Jobs Act. So you're right. Over the last decade or so, we've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of public companies. They're much bigger when they come to market. Over 60% of the market today is in private hands. And so what that really means at a practical level is a sort of a bifurcation of access where large institutions and other private market investors are able to access those companies while private leaving the more retail, you know, the, the average investor on the sidelines really until those companies come public. And when they come public, if you think about it sort of like an elevator and the first through the 15th floor, the companies have incredible, you know, exponential growth. The private market investors have the opportunity to ride that elevator up to the 15th floor. And only when the company goes public do the retail investors and other, you know, a- average Joes, average Eds and Hopes have the opportunity to jump on the elevator, which are already at the 15th floor. And so the upside of getting in at that late stage is much less than it is when the company is smaller and more nimble. Ultimately, our, our belief is companies, we'd love to see companies going public earlier in their life cycle. Uh, we we're trying to do a lot of things to facilitate that, because sort of the conceptualizing the pathway to public and trying to think creatively about how to provide that. Well, there's been a lot of challenges, you know, over the last uh, year even to kind of deal with. And I think there's definitely perhaps the digital nature of companies maybe um, has kept them from having to go to the public markets. They are able to, maybe it's just not as, as capital intensive perhaps. Uh, but it, so it sounds like it's a mission of yours to help expand that pool of younger and newer IPOs. Absolutely. Um, and we've tried to think creatively and working with, uh, you know, people across the ecosystem, if you will, on kind of re-envisioning the pathway to public. It doesn't have to just be a, the traditional IPO. And we've frankly pioneered that um, a, a couple in a couple of areas, one being the direct listing, which we've had a number of direct listings under the construct referred to as the selling shareholder construct, meaning companies don't necessarily need to raise capital. They have founders and employees who have been with them for a very long time and are looking for a liquidity event. So the first iteration of our direct listing was to provide exactly that, an opportunity for a liquidity event for the longstanding shareholders. And day one, immediately to provide access to individual investors in the secondary market. And so that's something that the SEC just approved recently, right, this year? They just approved the 2.0 version of our direct listing construct. So the, the one that the SEC just approved in December, we're also incredibly excited about. It's a direct listing. The second, the 2.0 version of it also has attendant to it a, um, a primary capital raise component. So it's a direct listing with a capital raise. We haven't had anyone come to market yet. It was just approved by the commission. We're very hopeful for what that new pathway to public could mean in 2021. So you now have IPOs, two flavors of direct listing, and of course, the SPAC Bonanza that we've, the special purpose acquisition company construct as a path, as another pathway to public that has taken hold 
this year in a real way. And we'll see lots of exciting things to come in 2021. It was a banner year in 2020 for, for SPACs, right? How many different companies went went public via the SPAC route? In 2020, the NYC uh, led the industry in SPAC proceeds. We had 63% of SPACs go public on the NYSC, including the six largest SPAC IPOs of the year. And then m- moving later into 2020, we ultimately listed 20 of the combined businesses of SPACs. We have really sp- seen a, quite an evolution of the SPAC construct. And w- we've already had uh, many, many SPACs go public this year in 2021. So now you've got the uh, traditional IPO process. You've got two versions of direct listing and SPACs. I don't know the right way to ask this. Are there pros and cons of those various methods? Or perhaps I should uh, ask this in terms of considerations investors should consider <laughs> um, with regards to buying into a SPAC or versus a company that goes direct listing. Is an IPO, for instance, more robust perhaps and, and therefore the investor is safer because of the level of information that's available? Uh, is there a way to think about that in your mind? Yeah, it's a good question. And there's a lot of false narrative out there, frankly, about the access to information that one might have with, say, a direct listing as compared to an IPO. From the issuer standpoint, it's the same paperwork that's filed with the commission. There are some open questions about the difference between having an underwriter, as you would in an IPO, and having a financial advisor, as you do in a direct listing. They're typically the same types of entities. Some have suggested that there's reason for investors to be concerned around the obligations attendant to each of those roles. But from a disclosure standpoint, from a transparency standpoint, it's the same set of materials that's filed with and reviewed by the commission, which is really the most important guardrail to the process. With SPACs, you're investing in the idea of the the team that's creating the acquisition company and the, you know there there are ideas for ultimately their business combination it, it's an identical set of materials that are filed with the SEC and so from a transparency standpoint it's not an operating company at the time that it goes public it's an acquisition company in terms of considerations if you're an, if you're a, an investor who who wants to make the choice to invest in the ideas that a SPAC has about the future, then the market should provide that investor choice. All these different pathways to public are really to, designed to give issuers and investors choice. And of course, against the backdrop of, we, we believe it's, it's much more beneficial for investors and issuers to come to the public markets than to remain private and contribute to really the bifurcation of wealth between uh, based on investor access. Recently, I guess the SEC uh, had a proposal out there for the adoption of standards regarding corporate ESG disclosures. What role do exchanges play in, in supporting ESG? It's a great question. It's really timely, um, particularly given the political climate going into this year. We spent a lot of time thinking about these questions, and we really think we have an opportunity to make a difference at the NYSC. First and foremost, we've been thinking about these issues, including you know, take the E and the S and the G. If, if you're looking at the S, for example, which many would argue embodies some of the diversity discussion, over two years ago, we established the Board Advisory Council with the NYC. And that's really our, it's a system where we are leveraging our listed company community and giving them opportunities to exchange information with each other and to try and solve some of these problems around board diversity in particular. The way where we sit as an exchange, we really find ourselves in the middle of interested parties, issuers and investors. And our job as an exchange is to, you know, pr- create create an environment for an exchange of ideas and create pathways towards the development of ideas. So the Board Advisory Council is an example of where we've looked to harness the community that we have that we have at the NYC and pairing up issuers who are looking for diverse candidates for their board or potentially their management team with available candidates, trying to solve the what some have referred to as the pipeline problem, where companies universally want to do the right thing. And sometimes they're trying to figure out how to do that. So, you know, our the way that we conceptualize 
our role with, with respect to ESG is providing opportunities to create a platform for that exchange. Another example is something that we're really excited to be launching this year, which is an entrepreneurial boot camp that's going to be um, designed specifically for Black and minority-owned businesses. And again, we keep coming back to the theme of you know, creating pathways, whether that's to the public markets, whether that's to development of a new program around ESG, whether that's a pathway towards you know, deep pools of liquidity. It's a theme that cuts across a lot of um, what, you know, basically everything that we, that we do at the NYC. So we're excited to launch the, uh, the boot camp series this year. And then our sister company or our affiliate, ICE Data Services, they've done a lot around ESG data using incredible technology to come up with data sets for, for buy side investors to be able to, you know, look across the broad swath of industry players and make decisions based on whatever metrics are, are important to them. So it's not something that's specific to NYC, but it's part of the ICE culture to, to harness and utilize data for those kinds of decisions. So maybe putting a, a bow on the discussion of public companies or the importance of public companies, perhaps in a phrase, wrapping it all up or summarizing it, uh, you know, why is it important that we have a, a healthy and robust IPO market and public company market? It's huge. It's really a fundamental investor access point that when, when you bring a company to the public market, you democratize their access for ordinary people globally to invest in that company and invest in the idea, invest in the dream that's bringing, helping bring that company to market. When a company stays private, it's available only to the few, whether that's the few very sophisticated or the few very wealthy. So it's really a, a broader kind of bifurcation of wealth set of principles, which makes it really important for companies to continue down the pathway towards the public markets and provide access to investors. That's a really interesting point, interesting angle that you described, because it goes kind of to the heart of the national I guess, discourse or discussion on the wealth gap, and you talked about uh, democratization of access. How would you gauge the Biden administration's appetite to, to make it easier to go public or to open up the, the, the public markets to, to more investors? I think some would argue that deregulation is what created the current construct, where you've deregulated the private markets so much and provided more opportunities in the private market so that companies just stay there instead of going public. Perhaps one way to conceptualize it is if there is going to be regulation forthcoming, perhaps that regulation could be more focused on introducing new rules of the road in the private markets. I imagine that could be done bringing to bear principles of investor protection. There are many who believe justifiably in many cases that the private markets introduce opportunities for investor harm. Again, the rigor and the transparency afforded by the SEC registration process and frankly by the public shareholder pressure brought to bear in public companies doesn't exist in the private markets. And so you can have uh, the more opportunities that you have for private investors to invest in private investments, the more opportunity for risk and, and harm there could be. So I, I have to believe that the framework would be one of investor protection uh, and how that takes shape remains to be seen. We'll have to wait until the powers that be take the reins at the SEC in particular. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, do you have a, a take on Gary Gensler's appointment to uh, chairman of the SEC? So Gary Gensler is going to be the new SEC chairman, and we are very excited about the opportunity to work with him. Gensler has a pretty unique set of perspectives coming into this job that we haven't seen in some time. He was chairman of the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, during the financial crisis, during the Dodd-Frank implementation process. So he has seen, from a different angle, the derivatives and, and future side of the market, but he has seen what it means to implement large-scale change. He has a very global perspective, having to work across Europe and with other jurisdictions on implementing cross-border initiatives under Dodd-Frank. So I think he comes at the job with a very, uh, very markets focus. He's, he's an expert in markets and a really holistic way of looking at the regulatory environment. 
so I, I, we're, we're hopeful that that's going to mean a set of very balanced way of looking at the world. What it means for listed companies and the public versus private markets, all of that remains to be seen. The policymakers in Washington, within the Biden administration, on Capitol Hill, and now in both chambers, in leadership positions, are very focused on public company disclosure. I hope that they're also focused on private market disclosure. And some of those are around the E and the S and the G that we just talked about, climate change being, you know, kind of a, a low hanging fruit, if you will, one that I expect to see some movement on at the SEC. So he's also has a, a small subset of our audience might be really interested in the fact that he also has a great deal of knowledge in the cryptocurrency space. What would be your odds on a on a Bitcoin ETF this year? Jeez. Oh, um, <laughs> well, um, on a Bitcoin ETF, why, why don't I frame it this way? So, you know, the Bitcoin is regulated by the CFTC. So I think there's work that could be done to see the extent to which the SEC might have a role in regulating that asset class. So that's one set of questions that I wouldn't take off the table entirely. Again, thinking about harmonization, thinking about global perspective. I don't know, have any special information to lead me to that conclusion. I'm just positing it as a possibility of, you know, an even higher order framework for looking at the question of cryptocurrency. Assuming for the sake of argument that the SEC doesn't start regulating Bitcoin as a security, what are the opportunities for, the, for advancing an ETF? Um, I think there, the questions that have been raised around investor protection will continue to persist. My hope is that we're now several years in to the development of a more transparent trading environment for the underlying. And so my hope is that with some data being brought to bear by various parties demonstrating the resiliency of trading this asset class, that perhaps that, that might move the ball forward. I do think that the investor protection concerns will continue to be there. But perhaps we'll find a path forward in 2021 for the Bitcoin ETF. So you're saying there's a chance. Saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Given the political landscape and, and uh, what have you, the new administration coming in, are there any other legislative efforts or regulations that, that you're watching that you think investors should uh, keep a watch out for? Big ticket items, I think, are going to be very focused on the public issuer Space, at least out of the gate. One of the things that we've been focused on here at the NYC in 2020 is the trend, or whether that's a durable trend or not, towards off-exchange trading, what, what that might look like, whether that will change once people are back in the office, perhaps spending less time trading on their phone, <laughs> sitting at home, working from home. I, I'm kidding. But you know, th there, there's a lot of discussion happening around the retail trend and the, the correlated off exchange trading. So I, I don't know what that means for a regulatory priority. It's clearly something that has gotten the attention of some from a transparency standpoint. And again, when you're thinking about the retail component to it, good questions are being asked about whether there's a problem to be solved. And I don't think anyone's concluded that there is in fact a problem to be solved, but I could imagine that being a question that people are asking. What about the proposed financial transactions tax? Is that Still something to watch for? It's still something to watch for. As states find themselves in a position of not having federal aid coming out of COVID, states are struggling. This, it's a real struggle. We're very sympathetic to it. They're trying to find places where they can extract some additional dollars for, to make up for their budget shortfalls. We spend a lot of time trying to engage in a thoughtful way with the legislators in New Jersey. And most recently, in the New York state legislature has introduced a construct for advancing a stock transfer tax, which is a tax that harkens back to the early 1900s when it was originally adopted. And there's been a rebate structure in place since the 80s. The idea now is to get rid of that rebate and re-implement the tax. So there are a lot of open questions about the applicability of it to today's market structure. There are a lot of people, a lot of policymakers in New York who believe this to be a good idea. When you look at the overwhelming success that Wall Street has had in 2020 and compare that with the overwhelming crisis that many on Main Street have experienced in 2020, 
it's easy to understand why imposing a financial transaction tax might feel like the right solution for some. There are a lot of really problematic aspects to an FTT, including harm to the quality of the market. The fact that this tax, like every other tax, is ultimately passed down to the end investor. So those who would argue that this is seeking to protect Main Street and hurt or at least you know, take something away from Wall Street that they already have too much of, at the end of the day, you're pushing it down to the pension fund holders, the firefighters, to the retail investor in their 401k. Every time those portfolios rebalance, the tax would be attached. So ultimately, it represents a diminution of portfolio value. And so we're spending a lot of time trying to educate policymakers on how this is in New York in particular, in New Jersey in particular. This is We appreciate why it's an appealing idea, but it's really a bad idea at a bad time. We really should be opening the economy, opening doors, not shutting them. So there's more to come on that front. And, you know, hopefully uh, cooler heads will prevail. What's one long-term trend you see playing out over the next year or several years? You know, I'd have to say investor engagement is a, is a big theme. There's a fundamental question being asked about the role of a public company. When a company is public, what are its own obligations? What are, you know, who are the company's stakeholders versus its shareholders? The stakeholder shareholder question. So I think that there's going to be a lot of discussion about the role that companies p- play in the marketplace and in America, you know, the fabric of America and frankly, globally. Okay. We do a segment called Trend or Fad and I get to hit you up with a few different concepts. Okay. Uh, and, and all you have to do is say Trend or Fad. Uh, if you wanted to explain it, you can. If you don't have to. Okay. Connected home fitness, trend or fad? Trend. Deurbanization, trend or fad? Fad. Cryptocurrencies, trend or fad? Trend ish. And plant based food, trend or fad? I think trend. I think trend. Well, this has been wonderful, Hope. Thank you very much for your time. What's the best way to follow you? Well, first and foremost, you can learn more about a lot of the things that I've talked about today by going to nyc.com. And if you want to contact me directly, you can find me on Twitter at, at Hope Jarkowski. Again, thanks, Hope, for joining. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Ed. It was really fun, and I look forward to staying in touch. Stay healthy. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Trends with Benefits. 